So our third speaker today is Professor Mike Benton from the University of Bristol. He's a world leader in vertebrae paleontology and is fascinated by the transformation of paleobiology from a speculative subject to a testable science. Mike led one of these discoveries on how to determine the color of dinosaurs, rated as one of the top scientific discoveries of the 2010s, and he was elected as a fellow of the Royal Society in 2014, for fundamental contributions to understanding the history of life. Mike has written many books on paleontology, accessible to all, and has discussed um, life scientific with Jim Al Khalili on Radio 4, which I encourage everyone to check out. I'll now hand over to Mike for his talk on dinosaurs, new visions of a lost world. Thank you very much. And um, I'll try to sh share screen in a moment. I hope I've been made co-host so that I can do that. Um, so this is great to talk to. I'm very sorry that it's being done at a distance. Um, I have done Herdman symposiums in Liverpool in person in the past, and it was wonderful. Um, so I'm go I've got three themes that I'm going to talk about in this talk. It relates to a new book. It's about the color of dinosaurs. It's something that attracts the general public and is probably of interest to many um, students because it raises the question of how do we know? And so the three themes I want to talk about are number one, actually, how do we know the color of dinosaurs? Number two, how is this actually scientific? Because of course, a lot of times if you are asked, um, what did the ancient world look like? Whether you're interested in dinosaurs or volcanoes, you're applying principles of uniformitarianism, but there's still a little bit of a let out where you say, well, we don't really know unless we have a time machine and we can go back. Well, I think I want to counter that a little bit and say, well, actually, yeah, we do know quite a lot and we don't need a time machine for everything. And thirdly, it, it's the fantastic story of all these amazing fossil discoveries from China. And it's been a relatively quick um, story, only 25 years. So here we go. I'm going to attempt to share a screen, which I can do. That's great. And um, here we are. And my title, Dinosaurs, New Visions of a Lost World, which happens to be the title of the book as well. And so we go back 25 years. We go to New York, 1996, October, a meeting at the American Museum of Natural History when the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology was meeting. And this is the professional body that I belong to. It's mainly North American, but it's international. Typically their meetings would have a thousand to 1500 people. But something unusual was going on. There was a buzz in the air during this meeting. Um, and it was reported in fact, in the New York Times during the meeting. And this is a most unusual press report because um, not only was it announcing an amazing new discovery, which at the time was unbelievably unexpected, the idea that dinosaurs could have feathers. This is very commonplace now, everybody knows it, but at the time that was very revolutionary. But secondly, this New York Times report was not reporting a paper or a talk or a poster. It was not reporting any formal part of the program. In fact, as you can see reading the thing, it's talking about the corridors, the crowded hallways, there was a buzz of conversation, what was going on? And indeed notice towards the end, there's, na there's mention of Dr. Phil Curry. He's a very famous dinosaur researcher from Canada. And he held a big key. He was the only person at the meeting that had special knowledge. But let me just tell you the full story. At the meeting, a Chinese paleontologist called Pei Ji Chen was walking around with photographs of this extraordinary specimen. Chen came from the Paleontological Museum in Nanjing, the second big city of China. And he was asking people, what did they think? Is it a dinosaur? Is it a bird? What is it? And you can imagine all the paleontologists were absolutely bowled over by seeing this specimen because its color, it's got soft tissues, there's gut contents, it's got all the, the skeleton is complete. And what we were really looking at, of course, were, were these um, whiskery structures that run all the way down the head and the back, something like a Mohican in the middle of the head, down the back and tufts along the tail. And of course, this was astonishing. What is it? What are these structures? 
And he wanted to get the opinions of all the leading individuals. And that certainly didn't include me at that time. Meanwhile, at the same time, and in Beijing, the capital of uh, China, at the Geological Museum in China, this paper was just being published while Chen was showing his specimen around. And two authors, G and G, named this um, specimen that they had, Sinoceropteryx prima, which means something like Chinese reptile wing the first. And if you look at the classification, they are very definitely putting it in Aves, Linnaeus, 1758. It is a bird, according to them. So they are confident that these whiskery structures along the back and the tail are feathers, even though the skeleton of this beast is absolutely not a dinosaur. And this is absolutely not a bird, I should say, but it is a dinosaur. And this is where Curry came in, because Phil Curry had, in fact, been in Beijing the week before. He had seen this specimen at the National Geological Museum of China, and he had told the colleagues there, actually, this is not a bird, it clearly is a dinosaur. Um, and he was able to say, just looking at it, this is related to Compsognathus from the late Jurassic of Germany, which had been known for a very long time. So what was going on? These two amazing discoveries at the same time. And two years later, Chen eventually was able to publish his description of the Nanjing specimen here in nature. So it got much wider attention around the world in English. I should have said that G and G was published originally in Chinese. This is a later English translation. But of course, Chen was not able to name this as a new species because he realized it was the same species as the Beijing specimen. But what was going on? In fact, here is the Beijing specimen. Here is the Nanjing specimen, skullduggery, look at them. They're not only members of the same species, they are in fact the same specimen. And even though they have different catalog numbers, one is in the big museum in Nanjing, the other one is in the big museum in Beijing, clearly some nifty collector or dealer had realized what they had. And on splitting open this thing, I should say the block is about a meter long. Um, in splitting this thing open, they realized, hmm, we've got this fantastic specimen and we can actually sell the two halves to different museums, which is what they did. And in fact, the Nanjing one is rather better than the Beijing one because it's got more of the positive specimen, if you like, whereas the Beijing one has got a lot more, a lot more molds of bones. But there we are. And what can we say? That's history. The type specimen is the one on the right. But the more important point is, this is my first big theme, is how has this amazing, uh, these amazing specimens and then all the other ones that were found since changed our understanding? And the answer is, it has changed our understanding enormously. So we need to wind back to what we knew before these discoveries. And everybody knows about Archaeopteryx as one of the most important and famous fossils. In fact, there are multiple specimens. This is just one of them. There are 10 or 15 of them. And they come from the latest Jurassic of uh, Germany. And very, the story is very famous. The first one was found in 1861, and it ended up in the Natural History Museum in London. And um, this is the Berlin specimen. This one was found later, I think, in 1877. So a whole stream of these were found over the years. But when Huxley, Thomas Henry Huxley, saw the specimen in London in 1861, he immediately realized its importance. It was, as he said, a dinosaur in bird's clothing. And when you look at the specimen, you can see the bones, whoops, the bones are beautifully preserved. They're three-dimensional. In fact, they look just like modern chicken bones. They're so beautifully clean and white. And uh, the whole skeleton is there, every rib, every little vertebra of the tail, every claw, even the, the claw sheaths. In other words, the, the covering of the claw made of, just like our fingernails, the sheath of the claw covering the bone is made from keratin, the protein keratin. And you can see they prepared each wing, each claw tip on the wing. But most importantly, it's got a full uh, preservation of the feathers, of the wing, the tail, and the whole body. And this couldn't have been better time because Darwin had published his On the Origin of Species in 1859. In that book, if you've never read it, you really should. He has two chapters on paleontology and geology. And he's more or less predicting that knowing that the knowledge of the fossil record was rather poor, 
in the 1850s that surely through time, paleontologists will find more and more fossils that will help us to understand evolution. And here was perfect timing. Here was the most brilliant missing link, if you like. But that was almost all we knew for a very long time. And this is a very simple diagram, but it's just meant to represent here is Archaeopteryx, 150 million years old. If you go downwards, you have the dinosaurs and plenty of dinosaurs and Huxley got it right. And of course, since his day, many thousands of new dinosaurs have been discovered. And then you go all the way up to the present day, we've got modern birds and we've got very, lots of fossil record of the modern birds back through the Cenozoic, some of them even into the late Cretaceous. But there are very long gaps with very little information below and above Archaeopteryx. And this for a long time was why the creationists loved Archaeopteryx, because they were able to say, it's a bird, it's got nothing to do with dinosaurs. And it was perfectly created because it's got 30 unique features that make it a bird. And it needs all of these features of feathers and hollow bones and all kinds of other adaptations to enable it to be a bird and to enable it to fly. But now, thanks to the Chinese fossils, we've got so much more. And so it's, it's wonderful to visit these localities. So I first went to these localities in 2007. We did a two week field trip around Liaoning province. You can see on the map, Beijing is shown by the red star and Liaoning province right up in the northeast uh, in pale blue. But in fact, these um, early Cretaceous back to mid Jurassic rich fossil deposits are known over much of North China and even into North Korea, but so far we've not been able to do field work there. I'm not quite sure why, but there we are. But the important thing to look at is when you see the stack of sediments, um, these immediately tell a story, um, and you shouldn't be surprised to realize that these are lacustrine sediments. You're looking at varving, which is annual or short time scale uh, 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 cyclicity of deposition. Here and there, you can see some iron staining showing up as a rusty color. And in fact, in petrological analysis, these are rich in ash. So they are not prim primary ash beds, they are secondary ash beds where the volcanic ash has been recycled and deposited in a lake. And here and there, you can see some black of obvious phases of anoxia. So all of this information gives a kind of explanation for why the fossil content is so fantastically well preserved, including soft tissues. Being a lake is a good thing because depositional environments are quite gentle and unperturbed and therefore um, carcasses and leaves and, and bits of organisms tend to be undisturbed. Secondly, there are many, many cycles of anoxia that helps preservation because you don't get a great deal of um, perturbation by other organisms feeding upon these carcasses. And thirdly, probably the influx of ash going all the way through makes the water somewhat acidic and anoxia and acid tend to tan the skin, just like the bog bodies of Denmark and Ireland plus the anoxia, meaning that they're not perturbed, and for all those sorts of reasons, and probably more that I don't fully understand, uh, we get fantastic preservation. This one locality, Sihitun Quarry, which I've visited a number of times, has yielded 1,000 specimens of birds, Confucius ornithids, and they all tend to be complete and with feathers. They're not all totally beautiful. Some of them are a bit broken up like this one, but nonetheless, we have stomach contents here. But there's a shopping list of fossils that you can read down the side that are typical of lacustrine deposits. These are the same age as parts of the Wealdon beds of the south of England, where you find similar fossils, but not so well preserved and not so abundant and not so many birds and dinosaurs, unfortunately. So let's have a look at some of these dinosaurs with feathers. Sinoceropteryx, we've already seen. There's the fossil. There's a fanciful reconstruction of what it might look like. It's a dinosaur. It's a compsognathid, one dinosaur group with simple feathers. But are they feathers? When, they, when it was published, the authors were a wee bit cautious. And whereas the Chinese authors just called them feathers, Chen and colleagues in the Nature paper called them protofeathers, but nonetheless, they're feathers. And if you look at the specimen, there's the tail on the right, figure B, 
the vertebrae of the tail pinkish, and you can see these tufts of strap-like structures, and these are the so-called protofeathers. Some people, though, were not happy with that, and they said, no, they're shredded skin, they're anything but feathers. And of course, for people like myself and others who, say, who accepted that Huxley was right, that birds evolved from dinosaurs, simple, 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 of course they're feathers. And the people who were denying it, they were wriggling and squirming because they didn't want to accept that birds evolved from dinosaurs. And there's still two or three people who make a big fuss about this for reasons that escape me. Uh, in the same year, 1998, the second of the feathered dinosaurs was published, and this belonged to another group. This is not a compsognathid, this is an oviraptorosaur. It's another group, um, and it's got feathers. And of course, this was enough for most people. It doesn't just have whiskery feathers, it's also got pennate feathers. So we have many names for the, the proper complex feathers of birds. You need to remember that birds have all kinds of simple feathers, some of which are just like little whiskers, some of which are down feathers, which are just fluffy things. But the feathers we mainly think of are the so-called pennate or pennaceous feathers. They are the ones that have a central quill or rachis and branching barbs at the side. And these, these comprise the contour feathers, the flight feathers, etc., etc. They are complex. And Chordiptrix has got them on its arms and on its tail. It's obviously not capable of flight because the wings are far too small. Maybe it's capable of gliding, but not anything like flapping flight. But the key point here is those pennaceous feathers are complex. They are not shredded skin, they are feathers. And all the close studies showed that the doubters were massively wrong, that the feathers show all the properties of having been keratin and the detail, the content of color, and all the other features are in detail, just what you expect with feathers. Microraptor, even more diverse array of feathers. This one could fly, and that was realized quite early on because the area, the total area of wing surface, and the fact that it's got four wings is really fascinating. It's obviously an independent acquisition of flight. But the area of the wings, if you add it all up, is quite enough to lift that thing off the ground. Because there's a simple aerodynamic ratio, which is the ratio of the wing area, the total wing area, available versus or over the estimated body mass. And in the case of Microraptor, yes, it could fly. Loads of birds, I'm not going to talk about them in any detail, but just so you know that there are great numbers of different species, thousands and thousands of them. And all of them as amazing as arch the Archaeopteryx specimens, some of them even more so. Here's a very famous specimen on the right with a purported male and female, and the male presumably with long tail feathers, the female without. And this was already showing people back in the 90s that almost certainly these early birds, and maybe even many of the little dinosaurs were engaging in sexual selection. So if you have ever heard David Attenborough talking about the lyre birds or peacocks and all these other birds today that where the males have got amazing feather adornments that they flash and, and chatter and rattle at the females, you will be well aware of the whole theory of sexual selection, which of course, like everything in evolution is due to Darwin, he got it right. Um, and, and these male adornments and, and, and feathers lend themselves beautifully to developing into these extraordinary crazy structures, almost certainly go all the way back to many of the dinosaurs. What, do, what does all this mean? We filled out the fossil record. So that rather embarrassing diagram I showed you earlier where we hadn't really advanced much over Huxley, even by the 1990s. Suddenly the tree is full of stuff. We've got loads of dinosaurs with feathers all the way up to um, Archaeopteryx and representing many, many different dinosaur groups. Um, and then after Archaeopteryx, we've got loads and loads of birds that fit into the evolutionary tree all the way up to the modern type birds. So suddenly, against the creationists and all of their crazy suggestions, the tree has filled up. And it, a second feature this has done is it's more than just filling up the tree. It showed us that those 30 unique characters of birds, all those things like possession of feathers, flight feathers, hollow bones, air sacs and the specialized breeding, breathing system, and the fused furcular, what we call the wishbone, 
um, the semi-lunate carpal that enables them to fold the wing up, all that, all these special features. Guess what? They are acquired piecemeal over the tri late Triassic and most of the Jurassic, all the way through the evolution of these um, theropod dinosaurs. So there is no truth in the assertion of earlier evolutionists and creationists that somehow birds emerge fully fledged with all their unique features. No, just like everything else, they evolve piecemeal acquiring characters along the way. And of course, the early feathered dinosaurs could not all fly, but they had the feathers for other purposes, like insulation or sexual display. And that all makes fantastically good sense. And secondly, unlike what many people said, half a wing is certainly better than no wing at all, because it's very likely that many of these early feathered um, small dinosaurs were gliders. They would have been chasing their prey. They would have been escaping from other predators, leaping from tree to tree. And just like so many groups today, being able to glide is a fantastically great adaptation if you live in the trees, because it means you can jump that little bit further. Um, so that's been fantastic. And not only filling up the tree, telling us how birds originate, this is big stuff because this is big evolution. People ask questions about origins of groups and birds are a real target group because they're so fantastically diverse and successful today. We want to know how they originate. How does evolution work? How do innovations work? And this is a beautiful case study. Now it's massively well documented because of these wonderful fossils. And so you can look at something like at the top of the slide, the evolution of the wing. And it's not just the bones you get to look at, you actually get to look at the feathers and remember Chordipteryx with its silly little wings. Well, yes, we know that. It couldn't fly, but it certainly had little wings and many other things, Sinoceroptics didn't at all, but it's got kind of whiskery little feathery arms. and. Um, you know, we can work our way through and look at the evolution of the innovation of the aerodynamic wing. And we can look at how that was acquired. There are two ways to take off. If you imagine that you wanted uh, human beings to be able to fly through evolution, what could we do to be able to fly? We normally would just say, oh, get wings. You need to expand your arms and get wings. But that's because we weigh quite a lot. We need big wings to get ourselves off the ground. The other trick would be for the body to get smaller and smaller to, to the point at which the, the arms are the right size for it to take off. And that seems to be what happened in the theropod dinosaurs. So in this science paper from a few years ago, Mike Lee and colleagues were able to document in great detail Whereas the early theropods are maybe weighing 150 kilograms. So that's sort of double or three times the weight of a human. Um, and through the Triassic and Jurassic, they get smaller and smaller and smaller. Oops, to the point at which the wing works. Because there's no point 163 kilogram dinosaur trying to sprout out enormous wings to enable it to fly. And the evolution of miniaturization is for another reason, of course. It's nothing to do with the future prospect of being able to fly. It's to do with agility in the trees, I would suggest. And, and the smaller you get, the better you are at running around up and down trees. You can hunt your insect prey more successfully. And so there's a definite day-by-day -day, uh, evolutionary pressure to get smaller. And once you're up in the trees, like so many tree-dwelling animals today, from frogs and lizards and snakes and, and, and various mammal groups, all of which have evolved independently the ability to glide, um, as well as coupled with that three-dimensional vision and so on. Because of course, if you leap, you have to be able to see your target and not go flying past, which would happen if you had 2D vision. All of that. And so this is probably what was going on. And then eventually they get to the point at which they can fly in a powered sense. So it's important to remember that biologists, particularly biomechanics and functional biologists or aerodynamics experts, they include a whole bunch of things under the heading of flight. Flight includes gliding, parachuting, and all kinds of other means of staying aloft. We think of flight meaning purely flapping flight but, uh, or powered flight, but using the terms correctly, many, many dinosaurs could fly, 
uh, as shown in the brown areas in this evolutionary tree. A limited number were capable of powered flight, shown in green. Archaeopteryx and early birds were one, but there were a number of others, including Microraptor with its four wings. Remember that one? Here it is over on the left. That is clearly an independent origin of flight, and some of its relatives, like Chinuraptor, were close to being capable of powered flight. Here's another group that could fly, and not shown in the tree is another even weirder group. This is E. Chi, the dinosaur with the shortest name, Y. I. QI. And this one is feathered, but it also has got weird membranes. So this has been a really recent discovery, 2020, that nobody expected. Good Lord, multiple groups of dinosaurs with feathers uh, crossed that functional threshold of being enabled to fly, thanks to wholesale miniaturization. Um, and they just cross that simple ratio of wing area to body mass. And once you go beyond a certain um, threshold, you are capable of powered flight. Here is the discovery of color. Some of you will know the story, um, some of you perhaps not. So we published this paper in February 2010, and we're soon going to come to the 12th anniversary of that. I tick off the anniversaries because this was a daring proposition. We didn't invent the method. The, the method was invented by or discovered by Jakob Winter, who, who's now a colleague in Bristol, but at the time was a PhD student at Yale. And the method is based upon recognizing these structures called melanosomes. And if you have got well-preserved fossil feathers, you can identify melanosomes in those fossils. So this is how we did it. And this is how Jakob Winter did it. Um, but we do tick off the dates because we could so readily be disproved. Because what I'm going to show you is what we call a chain of inference, which is the application of uniformitarianism to a fossil example. But we are sticking out our necks and saying we can apply this principle and thereby identify the color of dinosaurs and fossil birds based upon a series of observations, each of which could fall to disproof. Most people didn't care about all of that. They were just excited. Wow, for the first time, you know the color of a dinosaur. Here is our example, which was Sinoceropteryx. And we were saying it was gingery all over with pale underside and white and gingery stripes in the tail. Jakob Winter and his group at Yale, and again, including Chinese collaborators, were working on a different fossil, Anchiornis, close to birds, but still a dinosaur. And they discovered it had fantastic black and white striped wings and speckles on the tail, or on the legs, I should say, black tail and a gingery crest. And you can see this was exciting for the press. They just loved it. And we were making a very definite statement that we could tell different reconstructions of these dinosaurs. We could say, for example, the one at the top is incorrect and the one at the bottom is correct not just because we like the one at the bottom or because we are professors and therefore you need to believe what we say, but we are saying we have got evidence. Here it is. The uniformitarian part is the discovery and observation that ornithologists had known for some time that many of the colors in the feathers of birds, in fact, the majority, come from melanin. And melanin is a well-known pigment that occurs very widely throughout all of life. It's found in fungi, in plants, in simple organisms, single-celled organisms, animals, inter in our internal organs. It's found in, in our hair, our skin. When melanin is uh, transmitted into a feather or a hair, it is enclosed within a melanosome, which is a capsule within the keratin structure. So the feather or the hair is made of keratin, this flexible protein that makes our fingernails and the piece of the claws and the covering of horns in cattle, for example. And this is a zebra finch. We looked at feathers from different parts of it. All the color you see there comes from melanin. And the gingery patch on the cheek is full of pheomelanin, a particular chemical form of melanin containing sulfur. And the melanosomes are all spherical, as you can see in the figure at the top, an SEM photograph. And the scale is one micron, one millionth of a meter. Whereas the other colors, the browns uh, and the blacks and, and the grays and, and, and blonde colors come from eumelanosomes, which are sausage shaped. 
and it's a chemically different form of uh, melanin containing copper, as it happens. Uh, and the colors, to some extent, come from those metallic components of the pigments. But the key point is we can tell color from ultrastructure, ultrastructural features, these capsules called melanosomes. So there's the story. The fossil exists, you take samples from the fossil, you put them under scanning electron microscope, you crank it up to about the highest magnification possible. And this is what we see, spherical structures, whether in solid form or moldic form. And these are molded into the structure of the keratin. So let's look back to our reference images. Is it like the top one or the bottom one? It's more like the top one because they are spherical, hence these are pheomelanosomes giving ginger. And so our reconstruction, we looked all over, we didn't find any eumelanosomes, we only found um, pheomelanosomes, so this was our reconstruction. This is what we call a chain of inference because this is actually testable. At each of those arrows, the whole hypothesis could fail. The leap from fossil to SEM is the first link, and any critic, any doubter who, who believes we've got it wrong uh, could, could very readily um, look at a, another specimen, a different specimen of Sinoceroptrix, just in case this was some weird artifact of this particular fossil. They could put it under their own scanning electron microscope, of course, just in case we were looking at some artifact or a bit of dandruff or something that had um, contaminated the sample, and we could easily fail, you know, that's a repetition of an experiment, and, and they could say, no, you got it wrong, that's absolutely wrong, this is what we find. Um, and then the second arrow at which it could fail is the inference from spherical melanosome to ginger color. And remember, this is based entirely on a uniformitarian principle. If this is only found in zebra finches, then we're on very, very thin ice. We were able to go ahead though, and the, the, the critical reviewers at Nature, of course, picked us up on this, are you really sure? And we were able to say, yes, this is ubiquitous in birds. Pretty much every bird feather you look at um, that has these different colors will have this relationship. The ginger is always pheomelanin, it is always a spherical melanosome. And it's not only birds, that's not enough, because birds, although dinosaurs are ancestral, they need to be bracketed. Now, let me give you another example. We could say, because many birds sing with a beautiful musical voice, that all dinosaurs did as well. But that is a logical fallacy, isn't it? Because, of course, if you could say all dinosaurs, because they include the ancestors of the birds, you could go back to the origin of life and say that the earliest cyanobacterium sang with a beautiful trilling song. No, that is a logical fallacy. You can only apply this uniformitarian principle if it brackets the group, the target fossil group. And the fact is that this relationship between color and melanosome shape applies also in mammals including ourselves. So if you have got black, brown, or blonde hair, you have got eumelanosomes in your hair. If you have got ginger hair, you have got pheomelanosomes. And they are also found, of course, in the hair of a red squirrel or certain kinds of foxes and, and dogs that have got that very bright ginger color, etc., etc. And between them, mammals and birds bracket dinosaurs, and they bracket most other fossil reptiles, because in fact, if you look at the evolutionary tree and track back from birds, you go back through dinosaurs, through archosaurs, through various other reptile groups, and from mammals, you go back through to the synapsids, and they branch in the late Carboniferous, something like 310 million years ago. And between them, they bracket pretty much all the fossil reptiles. So there's the story. It is testable. This is scientific, you don't need a time machine. Woof, here is our reconstruction. This is, this fantastic digital art is thanks to Bob Nichols, uh, who's based in Bristol. He has a company called Paleo Creations. And the way he generates these is he can choose every color, of course, from the infinite palette available to a digital artist. Uh, he has reconstructed essentially every feather and what we claim in this image is that everything you see is based on evidence. 
So the exact distribution of light and dark, the bandit mask, that was a discovery by Jakob Winter and his PhD student, Fian Smithick, who re-examined the specimens. And uh, the colors are, are uh, uh, from the melanosomes, the stripiness of the tail, all of that, even the lizard in its mouth, all of these features, the nature of the claws, their um, keratin sheaths, all of those are based upon fossil evidence. So this is the claim of the book, that every story we tell and every one of these spectacular artworks by Bob Nichols uh, represents um, evidence. Every feature that you see is based on evidence and we explain all of that. So here's the book, Dinosaurs, New Visions of a Lost World. So we're claiming for the first time ever, every color reconstruction by Bob Nichols, including that pterosaur on the front cover and everything else that I will show you uh, is based on uh, this new science that started in 2010 and has really boomed. It's sometimes called paleo color research, um, but it also includes textures and ultra structures and chemistry and a whole range of analytical techniques. So let's have a look at the second story. This is um, Cetacosaurus, meaning something like parrot reptile, and it's got that name because of its beak. So this is the frontispiece of the book, and we show a lot in this image and I'll show it again in a moment. We have the adult showing very detailed texture and blotchiness of the skin. We have a bunch of juveniles. We have this weird structure on the tail that we're claiming is feathers of a very peculiar sort. And um, how much of this we, do we know? We claim we know all of it. And I really need to make a slide, even that it had a black rimmed arsehole. And that is thanks to a recent paper by Jakob Winter just published uh, last year. But I don't think I, I have the detail of that, unfortunately. But what else do we know? The juveniles, why are we showing a great herd of juveniles? Well, in fact, there are hundreds of specimens in Chinese museums that look just like this one. And they share the characteristic that all of the juveniles are apparently the same age, and they are all pointing in the same direction. And thirdly, the sediment around them is airfall volcanic ash. This is not lake reworked ash like the other specimens that I showed. And this location, Lujia Tun, is a village that I've visited a few times. And it's known as the Chinese Pompeii. And all the evidence suggests very strongly that um, the airfall ash has literally trapped these dinosaurs. And it shows us two things that Apparently, these juveniles are kept together, they occur, they live together in juvenile clusters. This is biological, not geological. They've not been washed together. And the second point is that they um, hang together in groups of the same age. Um, and so we did a study of this specimen where it turns out from analysis of um, histological bone sections that they're all two years old, except for the one in pink, number one, which is a three-year-old big brother or big sister looking after his or her siblings. And there, is, there are one or two, not many, um, fantastic specimens preserved in the lake beds that preserve the skin. So here is an amazing specimen that's in the Senckenberg Museum in Germany, where we have an adult, it's about two meters long, and the skin and its original melanin-based color is all preserved. The dark color is melanin. And you can see the patches of color behind the shin and over the shoulder area and under the, gut, under the uh, neck area, the, the, the gullet area. <clears throat> and a lot of the back is covered with dark colors, patchy. There's some gut contents here. So this is a plant eater. So the gut is full of impacted uh, plant material being digested. Over the tail are these weird reed-like structures um, uh, just along the top of the tail. And thanks to these collections of babies on the one hand and, and specimens like this with the, the entire skin covering preserved, Bob Nichols working with Jakob Winter a few years ago was able to produce this series of um, detailed illustrations of the adult. And this is the basis for his digital reconstruction where every one of those rich details is supported by factual fossil-based evidence. And all of it we can point to and interpret in terms of chemistry and ultrastructure 
and comparisons with modern examples of preservation, right down to the fact that the claws are covered with black colored keratin sheaths. The horns on the heads, those lateral horns below the eyes are also covered by black keratin sheaths. And look at the speckled patterns. The counter shading is consonant with an animal that lives uh, in, 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 in forested areas. The third story is about a pterosaur. This one is a middle Jurassic pterosaur that we studied a, a few years ago and published on in 2019. It was well known for 100 years or more that pterosaurs were covered in uh, insulating whiskery structures that were commonly called pycnofibers to distinguish them from the hair of mammals and the feathers of dinosaurs on the other hand. And so in our paper though, we discovered something unexpected. And we made a case that these pycnofibers are actually feathers. And so here's the paper, the title, and this, these are photographs of what we saw. We studied a couple of specimens from the Middle Jurassic in one of the museums in Nanjing, working with um, Si Xiao Yang, who's a PhD student, and Professor Bayou Jiang, his supervisor, and a bunch of other people who were in Hong Kong and Bristol at the time. And what we found to our surprise was not only were there um, uh, pycnofibers, hollow pycnofibers like A and E, but there are also some with tufts at the end, tufts halfway down or tufting from the bottom. And in fact, the more we look, the more we realize that these represent structures that you find commonly in many, many dinosaurs and indeed in modern birds. And so we said, but what reason could there be not to call these feathers? These pycnofibers are actually just feathers. And in evolutionary terms, this is not so surprising because pterosaurs and dinosaurs are cousins. They're both, the first fossils of dinosaurs and pterosaurs are pretty much restricted to the late Triassic, but we know from uh, fossil examples of close relatives that almost certainly they share a common ancestor in the early Triassic. So if this is correct, feathers originate in the ancestor, the common ancestor of birds and of, of dinosaurs and pterosaurs in the early Triassic, 250 million years ago. So that's 100 million years earlier than we had thought. Remember that Archaeopteryx is 150 and the ancestor of pterosaurs and dinosaurs would be uh, 250 in the aftermath of the end Permian mass extinction. And I believe this is to do with the origins of some early kind of warm bloodedness in all of these beasts. And that the, the, the this very simple early feathers were primarily, primarily for insulation and that they were covering the body. And of course the pterosaurs, and as it happens, the small early dinosaurs were fast moving, somewhat warm blooded and having some kind of insulating coat uh, is a very clear adaptation for warm bloodedness. Here's Bob Nichols' reconstruction. There's not many patterns within these um, pterosaur feathers. They're just generally various shades of brown. And this anurognathid um, living in the middle Jurassic is about the size of a pigeon, a sort of rather plumpish pigeon, and looking happy because it's spotted a lace wing that it's about to eat. Another brief story, I'll just, I'll just tell a couple more and then finish in, in five, or, five or six minutes. Tupandactylus, an amazing pterosaur from Brazil. I want to show you a couple of examples, not from China, with this absolutely crazy uh, uh, head, which is ridiculously lightweight. And indeed the spars on the head are just like the spars on a sailing yacht. They are supporting a great uh, a membrane of skin which in the exceptional preservation of the Santana formation uh, can, is found to contain great numbers of melanosomes. And so it's allowed reconstruction of the colors in this crest, indicating that different species of Tupandactylus had an array of different colors as shown in the reconstructions. And indeed, some of them may have been photoluminescent, meaning that the melanosomes would be aligned in some particular way that they could pick up energy from the daytime sun that could be retransmitted at twilight, just like uh, glowworms and certain other beetles today. They can absorb and retain the energy and then transmit light in the dark. Here is Bob Nichols's reconstruction showing very, very uh, irregular patterns. 
and it provides about the only feasible explanation for the function of this crazy, crazy head sail. Because this animal has got a five meter wingspan. This is a true giant flyer. And the head is nothing to do with weather vane or aerodynamic function or anything like that. It's surely all to do with signaling and sexual selection. The final story is from Canada. It's a large dinosaur from the early Cretaceous, Cretaceous Athabasca tar sands, probably more or less pickled in the tar. And this is the reason for the exceptional preservation. But just so you know that we're getting information about skin and color from a variety of, kind of kinds of sedimentary settings. The lakes of China, I should have said the Santana formation is mainly shallow marine. Um, and, and Archaeopteryx and, and uh, Comsognathus likewise are in shallow marine deposits. These are terrestrial tar sands here. And this is Borealo Pelta, meaning something like um, northern armor. And you, when you look at the specimen, you can see it's liberally covered with armor. And some of the armor plates are quite scary, sharp edged. Um, but the bulk of the body, what attracted people first was not only are we getting the bony scutes, we're also getting preservation of the keratin covers of the, those bony scutes. And look at the ones towards the top. They are even slightly gingery or pinkish in color. And when they were analyzed chemically and for ultrastructure, they show that this is pheomelanin. And so detailed analysis of this published in 2017 and mapping out the different areas of armor and different functions. This is an ankylosaur, which is a large um, plant eater. You can see the scale bar there. So in life, this is about three meters in length, and it would have probably weighed five or six tons, a real giant that would be preyed upon by predatory dinosaurs, something like, but not exactly Tyrannosaurus rex, but relatives. And here is Bob Nichols' amazing reconstruction of this thing with really scary, sharp, scimitar-like blades over the shoulders. These blades are each a meter in length and the whole body covered with this gingery covered, colored um, keratin uh, going covering over the, the bony plates over the head and the body. So I want to wrap up with a quick rapid sequence of four or five slides just to talk about evidence and uniformitarianism and corroboration. So in the world of dinosaurs, we know all these things, one, two, three, four, five. And in each case, we have evidence. So we would say these are no longer time machine speculative things. These are things where we have data and we can make deductions and these deductions are testable and they can be refuted. We may be shown to have got them wrong and therefore they are scientific. And um, so we no longer have to be vague and apologetic when you're challenged in the pub by a doubter you know, geology is all make-believe because nobody can go back to the Jurassic or the Precambrian. So all of this stuff about oxygen and volcanoes and dinosaurs is all, and trilobites is all just made up. You can say, mm, no, not really. We've got uniformitarianism, we've got evidence, we can, we've got fantastic fossils, we can test things, we can be refuted. And in some cases we can corroborate our discoveries. So speed, Trackways, well-known formula, the faster you run, the wider the spacing of your footprints. And this empirical formula always works. And in the case of T-Rex, it gives a speed of 27 kilometers per hour, which sounds quite fast for a human being, but for a giant like T-Rex, it's actually a slow amble. Keep in mind, 27 kilometers per hour. This method works and it always works. You can apply a similar uniformitarian approach from the dimensions of the leg bones and reconstructions of the dimensions of the muscles. And John Hutchinson pointed out a few years ago that it would be relatively easy to measure the dimensions of limb bones, the femur in particular, of any extinct vertebrate and estimate the volume of the leg muscles because there is a well-known relationship in all living animals between the um, volume of leg muscles and the speed that can be achieved. And the human example is so easy. When you look at an Olympian sprinter, they have got massive leg muscles. Whereas if you look at my leg muscles, they're very weedy and I can't run very fast at all. And the very definite um, uh, uh, empirical 
exponential relationship between leg muscle and leg bone diameter and speed achievable. And it's very size dependent. The bigger you get, the harder it is to be a really fast runner because the muscle power needed is proportional to body mass, not body length, obviously, to shift the body along. And the calculation is a T-Rex modeled here as a six ton chicken uh, at best could achieve, guess what? 27 kilometers per hour, corroboration. Here's corroboration as well for bike forces. Could T-Rex bite a car in half? Yes, it could. You can, you can corroborate this, first of all, by doing physical experiments. So there are many examples of bones like that piece on the left where there are T-Rex gouge marks. We know that it's a T-Rex tooth mark because you can take a mold and the, the gouge has got exactly the shape of a T-Rex tooth, which is, have, has a very characteristic shape. And then you can do experiments in the lab with a force meter and a piece of cow bone and a tooth made of steel and you just drive it in and what force does it take to drive the tooth in three centimeters. And it's a force of something like 12 to 13,000 newtons. You can then corroborate that by doing another uniformitarian study entirely in the computer using digital modeling where you apply material properties of bone to the uh, uh, skull and you can calculate the various forces that could be applied to the food and the range of forces calculated by Bates and Falkingham are something like 35 to 57,000 newtons, which when you compare with modern biters from great white shark to human is absolutely huge. And of course, therefore T-Rex could clearly bite almost any car in half. And this is corroboration by two independent methods. Why do we believe the computational method? It's been championed over the years by Emily Rayfield, a professor at Bristol. And her argument is a very simple one. If you go up the uh, levels of a multi-story building, or if you walk across a modern bridge, or if you fly in an airplane, you are giving your life to trust that the engineering method called finite element analysis works. Because all of those structures were first designed in the computer. You don't build an airplane from aluminum and plastic and then fly it and see, does it work or does it crash? You design it in the computer. The material properties is massively important because of course the plane might work if it's built of steel, but not if it's built of plastic. And so Emily builds her 3D T-Rex skull as shown on the right. She applies material properties in enormous detail to all of those uh, cells, which are the finite elements. And having mapped in the properties in three dimensions, she can apply forces of various kinds and calculate what's, what's feasible. So I wrap up by three points. Number one is that um, China and the 25 years of Chinese paleontology that we've lived through is amazing and has filled out our knowledge and allows us to have great confidence about some really big questions in paleontology. Secondly, that's the second point really, is the testability, the application of uniformitarianism and if possible corroboration. But even without corroboration, being able to apply the method as in determining color, speed, bite forces, I didn't talk about growth rates, all sorts of other things we can determine. And for the first time, finally, Huff Puff, in this book, we are presenting 15 stories and we make a rather bold and arrogant claim that for the first time you may see in front of you dinosaurs, pterosaurs and marine reptiles in their original physical appearance, colors, patterns, bone textures, uh, skin textures. And that has not been feasible before. Um, and now we can. And I think in future, this will be the model that people will try to follow for dinosaur books, even for kids. So thank you very much for your attention. I'll stop there and uh, very happy to answer questions if there's any time. Hello. Thank you so much, Mike. That was really insightful talk. That was amazing. Uh, we do have a uh, question just on the, the chat. That's just, I'll ask these ones, then there's a little bit of housekeeping. Um, but I do encourage, if you uh, are ready to, um, to if, if Mike um, is happy to kind of uh, use Gather Town as well, that any further questions about his new book uh, and any previous books can be asked there. Um, so I'll just ask a few questions from the chat. 
Um, so we've got uh, quite a fun question from Fred Owen. Uh, he said, that's a truly amazing narrative. Thank you. It'd be wondrous to hear what Darwin would say if he knew what you have revealed. Uh, do you have an expression that you could imagine he would say? To Darwin, I think um, you got it right. And, and uh, his, Darwin's prediction that the fossil record would fill out our knowledge of evolution has been proved again and again. Um, although we still are aware of the, the great limitations and I think he, he was willing to think outside the box and I, my, my plea as well would be think outside the box, let's not be as apologetic as we sometimes are about the historical aspects of earth sciences. Thank you. Um, so uh, Heike Leiden says, uh, this is a stunning method to understand fossils better. What are its future or what are its future applications? Will we, uh, will we be once able to shed more light on the demise of pterosaurs using this method? Okay, so I oh, think um, the color method can be applied to any fossils because melanin occurs widely in nature. So I think people are very interested, are already looking at colors in plants and insects and it could be applicable anywhere really. There's a real difficulty though, or a payoff one has to be careful about that we use ultrastructure, which relies on shape. <clears throat> and people have looked at shrinkage and other risk to um, change in shape under pressure. I think though the shape is retained and that's fine. We'd love to be able to do it chemically because that ultimately could be an even sharper and quicker way to deal with this. But the difficulty we need to remember is that the majority of um, biomolecules organic chemicals, they break down and alter very quickly. And for example, everybody knows the story of DNA. The chances of getting real dinosaur DNA are very modest because it's such a labile, um, breakable molecule. Whereas some of the pigments like melanin are pretty tough and keratin is quite tough. So some of them may be preservable. Um, as for telling us about the demise of groups. I think it tells us about behavior, sexual selection. We now know, which we didn't know, that um, many dinosaurs, maybe pterosaurs, engage in sexual selection. That tells us a lot about um, shape and form. You don't have to look for aerodynamic functions of crazy looking tails. If like the peacock's tail, it is just for going off. The peacock's tail actually has nothing to do with flight. In fact, it's very deleterious to physical function. As for extinction, I don't think directly on their own, these, these discoveries will, will shed light on extinction. I think that requires wider knowledge of the fossil record and timing of events. Thank you once again. Uh, we'll just have two more questions and then we will uh, go to the second, we'll go into our lunch break. Um, Stephen Hurrell uh, asks, thanks for an excellent talk, Mike. Have you any ideas why the birds made it through the KT transition while, mm -hmm. while mm -hmm. other dinosaurs mm -hmm. didn't? <clears throat> I don't have any unique observation here. We need to recall that lots of birds went extinct through the Cretaceous and some at the KT boundary. Not a great number of birds made it through. Um, a recent suggestion from Dan Field in uh, Cambridge based on um, phylogenetic study of modern bird groups and those that were around at the KPG boundary, I think suggested that it was maybe ground dwelling forms that survived better and he connected this with uh, heat blasts that followed the, the, the impact and burned the forests and all sorts of things but we're thinking of the only real survivors early on were ancestors of chickens and ducks. And so they, they were the kind of basal ones that got through. Um, and how they did, who can say? It, it's very difficult because who went extinct, who survived um, is such a difficult one to pin down. And people are reconstructing a lot of the physical impacts of what was going on, obviously freezing and blacking out of the sun and uh, fireballs and who knows what, all sorts of stuff like that. But there's no very clear picture of, of why certain birds survived. Brill. Uh, so our Leonardo Ueda uh, has one more question. Uh, amazing talk. I remember being blown away by all the press releases of the 2010 paper. Uh, a 1.5 million year old, or a year 15 old. year old here. This must be a yeah, child I was, <laughs> Yeah, it was. I was mesmerized by the, uh, illustrations. Could the pterosaur feathers have evolved independently instead of coming yes. from a common ancestor? Yes, of course they could. 
Uh, and I think when you're making evolutionary reconstructions, you always have to keep in mind the possibility of convergence. And so for the moment, we're tentatively saying we take the parsimonious view, because in phylogeny, we, we rely on parsimony, meaning if there is a simple explanation, such as one point of origin, you take that. But evidence against it would be to for, for people to study the so-called feathers of pterosaurs and the so-called feathers of dinosaurs. And if they could find differences that suggest a different origin, that would be evidence for independence. At the moment, we're saying they are the same. The same shapes, they contain melanosomes in the same way. They apparently emerge from follicles within the skin. The pterosaur ones seem to be hollow, just like feathers, whereas mammalian hairs are not hollow. So we would say there's a kind of list of quite detailed features that make us believe they are the same. But there will be future studies on different specimens and people may discover reasons to say, no, fundamentally these are different and therefore we would posit um, separate origins. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, as I say, do check out New Visions of the Lost World. It is a really good read. Um, bit of housekeeping so our morning zoom session is finished and that's the same with whoever is watching on youtube um i do encourage everybody to uh once i've finished talking kind of just go and click on the new zoom link you'll be admitted soon once we open it up um so that'll be for the afternoon session uh one more thing please do uh, get involved with gather town any questions or just want to chat with anybody here and we've got our two charities that we promoted today uh, we'll be dropping the links in if anybody would like to donate any money towards those in the new zoom chat uh, thanks very much everybody for the morning session and we'll see you in the afternoon session and thanks again mike pleasure thanks all